Welcome to online worship at the Mayville and Campbellsport United Methodist Churches. My name is Steve Delano, and we're so glad that you've joined us on this Trinity Sunday. In my message, we will explore what Jesus means when he tells Nicodemus that he must be born from above. Please join me in prayer. God of majesty and power, how awesome you are to us. The mountain trembles, the seas roar at the sound of your name. Yet you have chosen to come to us in love and tenderness. You have called us to be people who will act in ways of peace and justice in your world. Open our hearts and our spirits to hear your word. And having heard to act in ministries of hope and peace for all your earth. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our opening hymn is Holy, 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 Lord God Al Almighty. This hymn was written by Reginald Heber. Let's sing together. Our New Testament reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with that person. Jesus answered him, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who's born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, 
You are the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If, you, if I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Today's passage from the Gospel of John centered on a discussion between Jesus and a Pharisee named Nicodemus. While most of the Pharisees were trying to discredit Jesus, Nicodemus was different. Not only was Nicodemus a Pharisee, but he was also a member of the Sanhedrin, in which, which was the Jewish court, much like our Supreme Court in the United States. The great Sanhedrin in Jerusalem was the supreme religious body in the land of Israel during Jesus' time. Yet Nicodemus was different. Nicodemus sought the truth. Nicodemus truly sought God. Therefore, as we examine the scripture passage, we should consider the text in the light of a Pharisee that is not like the others. He has seen Jesus perform miracles, and he thought that Jesus might just be the Messiah of Israel. His questioning of Jesus is not arrogant or contentious. The questions are so that he might learn more about Jesus, so that he might learn more about God. The scene begins at night as Nicodemus comes to visit Jesus. He might have been somewhat afraid to be seen talking with Jesus, or possibly he wanted a private conversation with Jesus that would be very difficult during the day, since Jesus was usually surrounded by large crowds. Nonetheless, he goes to Jesus with an attitude of curiosity. Jesus knows that Nicodemus is not like the other Pharisees, and his counsel with Nicodemus is more like that of a rabbi, like that of a teacher rather than an antagonist. The first thing that Nicodemus tells Jesus is that we know you are a teacher who has come from God. He understands. He knows that the miracles he has seen Jesus perform, the healing of the sick, the casting out of demons, he knows that these Miraculous signs could only happen if God was with him. Jesus responds that no one can see, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born again. Nicodemus does not understand how a person can be born again. Nicodemus is a man of rules, a man of the law of God. So Jesus explains this further to him. He tells Nicodemus that one must be born from above, one must be born from water and the Spirit. We are born from water when we are baptized, when we are purified, cleansed of our sins. And we are born from the Spirit when the Holy Spirit comes over us and we truly are in relationship with God. When we begin living for God and not solely for ourselves, this might be an aha moment when we are transformed by a personal experience or it might be a more gradual transformation in our spiritual journey with God. The United Methodist founder, 
John Wesley had one of these aha moments when he felt his heart strangely warmed. On May 24th, 1738, while listening to a reading about the book of Romans, he truly understood that his salvation lay in Christ alone. Wesley had been a follower of Jesus all of his life, yet he was almost 35 years old when he had his born-again moment. What about you? Have you been born again? Personally, I can't point to one specific time in my life for, that I had a similar transformation. For me, I believe there have been many transformational moments throughout my life that have led me to Christ. I look back to my parents making sure that I was involved in church activities as a child and as a youth to my wife, who sets a steadfast examples of loving God, to my children being called by God to serve him as pastors, to other clergy and Christian friends that have supported and encouraged me. While my journey is not complete, it has been a wonderful journey, being drawn closer to God, me pulling back from God, and on and on. Some of you have may, ha may have had similar experiences. Being born again is not an intellectual exercise, which might explain why it was difficult for a man like Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a Sanhedrin, a man of the law of God, to understand. Jesus calls Nicodemus a teacher of Israel. Yet Nicodemus still does not understand. Jesus reminds Nicodemus of what he has seen, that he has witnessed firsthand things that for humans are impossible, but with God are truly possible. Jesus knows that Nicodemus is strugg struggling to comprehend heavenly things. So he reminds Nicodemus of the story of Moses, that Moses lifted up a bronze snake on a pole, as God commanded, so that the people of Israel who confessed their sins against God might be spared God's wrath. Being born again is of the heart, of the soul. It is when we open our hearts to God to receive God's grace and invitation for the Holy Spirit to come over us. In the final section of the passage, Jesus tells Nicodemus that he is here on earth so that we might have eternal life. Let me read those verses again from John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The eternal life, the kingdom of God that Jesus spoke of, is our life shaped by and completely dependent on God's love and grace. It's not simply life in heaven after death. It is here and now as we entrust our lives to Jesus enter into God's reign, and depend on the Holy Spirit's guidance. Jesus invites all of us to receive life as God's gift. The crucified Son of God shows us God's love, scorned and rejected, but triumphant. If we trust Jesus, stake our lives on divine love, we will be reborn from above through the Spirit. By God's mercy, we will not merely be forgiven, but made whole, remade in God's image as participants in God's new creation. Amen. Please join me in an attitude of prayer. We are struggling, Lord. You know how difficult it is for us to hear the news of violence and warfare and to see dear lives lost 
in battle and in strife. We long for your peace to flood the world. We cry out for your presence. We wonder if you hear our cries. How small is our faith. From the very beginnings of time, you have poured your love into the world. People have made decisions about how to respond to that love. Some have chosen to act in ways of peace, justice, and mercy, loving ministries of kindness and compassion. Some have chosen to impose their will on others, never acknowledging the rights and lives of those that they oppress. Sometimes we, by our attitudes as well as actions, have acted in ways of oppression. But you forgive and heal us. You call us to be your witnesses of peace to the world. We do not need to crawl to you during the night of our fears for healing. You have given us new life in Jesus Christ who taught us about your love. Through Christ, we are adopted as your heirs, your beloved children. You have given us opportunities to bring hope and peace to others. Let us seize these opportunities for ministries of hope. Encourage our hearts, strengthen our spirits and our commitment to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please receive the benediction. God of infinite patience, loving presence, and dazzling surprises, be with us as we leave this place today. Guide and guard our lives and bless our witness to your love. We go in peace, seeking ministries of justice and hope. Amen.